Hello, a big happy welcome to you. You are so wonderful to take some time to listen. This is Hear Her Sports, long form intimate profiles of female athletes breaking boundaries, speaking up, and living with power and confidence. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery. This episode is very special. It is our 100th episode. In celebration of that, we have some bonuses for signing up on Patreon between today, March 25th, and April 7th. Plus, shortly, we'll announce how you can get in on a raffle of some sporty items like the illustrated book, Women in Sports, 50 Fearless Athletes Who Played to Win. 100 episodes seems like a lot because it is a lot. It's been more than five years since Hear Her Sports first launched. It has been exciting to watch the growth in women's sports in those five years, and at the same time, frustrating that there is still so much to be done. Just think of the absolutely terrible and comparatively terrible women's weight room setup at the NCAA basketball championships that hit social media last week. And hooray for social media, and also for support from men in basketball, along with a bunch of other leaders in sport, because all that noise caused some improvements to the women's gym area. However, that the NCAA believed it was okay to provide the women players what they did shows us exactly where we are. If you haven't been following all of this, check out Hear Her Sports Twitter to see some images of the luxurious super mega gym for the men and the embarrassing gym with one rack of dumbbells topping out at 30 pounds for the women. But enough of that. For the 100th episode, I'm indulging my own cycling and cyclocross love with a wonderful conversation with U.S. national cyclocross champion, Clara Hansinger. It was really fun for me to hear some behind the scenes stories of the cyclocross season I had watched on TV all winter. Also great in the episode are Clara's discussion of her long ride pod rides with the Scratch Lab folks, fueling for riding, strength training, race starts, the insanity of Euro cyclocross, what she's looking forward to in the road season, and what's coming up in this still uncertain time. But before I introduce Clara, I want to recommend the second episode of the current season of the Strides Forward podcast. In the episode, runner Charlotte Gibbs talks about her experience with REDS, Relative Energy Deficiency in Sports. What stood out to me was how it really was not that long ago when athletes started thinking about fueling for optimal performance. In all episodes of Strides Forward, the host and producer, Cherie Turner, intermingles her own insights and observations with audio from the conversations she has with long distance runners. Strides Forward comes out in series with all episodes connected by a similar theme. The first series was about experiences from the 56 mile Comrades Marathon in South Africa. The current series called Running in a Woman's Body just started last month and covers topics of menopause, reds and pregnancy. But whether you're a runner or not, all these stories are exciting and interesting. Take a listen in all the usual places, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on the website, stridesforwardpodcast.com. And now let me introduce Clara. Well, I am so excited to introduce today's guest, U.S. cyclocross racer, Clara Hansinger. Clara recently returned from this year's European racing campaign, so she is now in her off season gearing up for a COVID shortened road season. Clara grew up riding mountain bikes on the trails behind her home in Oregon and started racing as a teenager with the guidance of a high school teacher. After moving to Portland, Oregon for school, she discovered cyclocross and was immediately hooked on the physical and technical challenges of the sport. In 2019, she won the U.S. Elite Women's National Championships as a first-year elite and then joined the Cannondale Cyclocross World Team for 2021. She spent all of last season living and racing in Europe, where she earned two UCI Cyclocross World Cup podiums, second at Namur and second at Dendermonde, and finished up fourth overall in the World Cup final standings. Clara ended this stellar season with a fourth place finish at the World Championships on an incredibly difficult and sandy course. This summer, Clara will be racing on the road with Team Tibco Silicon Valley Bank. Beyond cycling, she is finishing her undergraduate degree in nutrition at Oregon State University and enjoys exploring farmers markets and neighborhood gardens in her free time. So welcome, Clara. This is, I mean, really, this is such a treat to have you on the podcast after spending the entire winter watching World Cups on TV. So thanks for making the time to be here. Of course. Thank you for having me here. I'm really excited to share. To start off, you know, could you bring us up to date on what you've been doing since you got back? You got back about a month ago, right? Yeah. So we returned to the U.S. in early February and most immediately I took two weeks pretty much entirely off the bike, uh, just 
taking a real off season, enjoying enjoying some unstructured time, the the relax and spend time with my partner and see some friends from a distance. Do you have trouble taking time totally off the bike? I do, honestly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I did about a week completely off and then picked up the commuter bike and just kind of ramble around. We had some lovely days of sunshine in Portland, which was where I was at. And so I just wanted to go spin around and take it all in. Do you have trouble taking days off during the season as well? Are you good about just lying around and doing nothing? No, I tend to do that pretty well, just because by the time you get to those days and you, you really need a day off, you you need the day off. And so you just really <laughs> take it off and collapse on the couch. I use it to catch up on other things in my life and get those done as well. So now that you've done a full season of racing in Europe, what's your attitude about the sport? So prior to the season, European racing, I still I had some decent results, but it, I hadn't cracked it. I hadn't it still felt like this higher tier of racing. And while in the United States, I felt comfortable and confident that I could show up to a race and be vying for a win. In Europe, it was still going over there and you're like, boy, am I going to finish top 10 or top 30? And so spending a year over there, getting the practice and get comfortable not only with the racing, but the, the total environment where we were living was really important to helping me make that step up to the next tier of racing, feeling like I could do well in European racing. What was the hardest bit? So we showed up initially very, I would say, fresh. (laughs) Uh, We we arrived in early November and we hadn't raced at all, whereas these European women have been racing since October. And we're really out of practice not only with technique and speed, but just the, the aggression that you need uh, in European racing, the, being able to throw elbows and hold your line and push someone else off their own line. And I'd say even as the season advanced and we got more and more into that kind of race form, it, it still is one of the greatest challenges is just how aggressive European racing is. I'm so curious about that aggressive aspect yeah, describe it more, I guess. It's it's just <laughs> yeah, it's very much a battle for every every corner. There's really no kind of let up and settle in. You're always moving forward, and if you're not moving forward uh, through a group or trying to make passes on riders, the squeeze in a line around a corner or on a corner to get around someone, you're ultimately going to be moving back. And so not only is it just like this physical, keeping your elbows out, holding that line, but it's this mental, just constantly like focusing on making sure that you're not getting past yourself and looking for the opportunities to move up around the rider in front of you. Hmm. You know, it's interesting because in TV coverage, obviously they're showing up front mostly, and there's some of that, but it's it sounds a little bit different than what you're having to deal with, you know, deeper in the pack as you move up. Yeah, very much so. I think there's a lot of racing that isn't captured on camera. A lot of pack racing where you're pushing other riders over with your shoulders. And even sometimes you'll find riders grabbing other riders, say on a run up. (laughs) And I've had experiences in a run up where you're going up and suddenly you feel somebody grabbing at your bike below you, just trying to keep their balance. And you know, move that extra spot. So it's it's very physical off the cameras. Wow. How do you prepare for that? Or how do you practice that other than being in the races? We spent a lot of time practicing with my teammates, Katie Keough and Curtis White. We're all on the Cannondale Cyclocross World program together. There was this uh, wooded area about an hour away from where we were staying in the Netherlands. And we'd go out and do cross practice. We spent a lot of time riding in the sand together to get ready for the world championships. And so some drills that we would do were make like a a quick 30 second circle loop where the goal is to just catch the person in front of you. They kind of keep lapping the person 
they'll always be moving towards the front. And so, yeah, spending a lot of time working with Katie and Curtis and getting comfortable being bumped around and pushed out of lines and sometimes pushed over, <laughs> uh, as well as being comfortable kind of pushing someone else over. It's honestly a lot of practice off the race course. You know, I don't want to put anything on you, but that doesn't seem like your personality. No, <laughs> not at all. It's really difficult for me. Yeah, it's especially with my teammates, people I really like, and I don't want to hurt them or, yeah, doing anything that, that offend them. And so it, it does take, there was a lot of time, like, come on, Claire, just, just be aggressive, throw an elbow, <laughs> really pinch <laughs> me in the corner here, I'll be fine. And so it, it takes quite a bit of warming up. But when it comes to racing, I find that just being kind of in that, that race mode, you're able to, to channel the focus much more quickly. I'm still not quite up to, I'd say, the, the kind of aggressive level that some of these Belgian and Dutch women are. But I definitely feel that I'm, I'm getting, my elbows are getting a little bit sharper. <laughs> Can you practice that off the bike? You know, like you're home now in Portland walking down the street <laughs> if it weren't COVID or something. I don't know. It, it just seems like such a, a mental shift that needs to happen. Yeah, I'd say overall, there's, there's points at which you want to be aggressive and really go try to make that pass. But there's also points at which you need to be reserved and um, save energy and understand that trying to make it pass, maybe you'll, it's really too risky at that point in the course say there's like a a really slippery corner and if you make it pass then you're not only potentially going to crash yourself out you're going to crash this other person and so the best thing to do is really just the weight so I tend to apply that a lot and when I'm out in public you know you see a line in front of you and you give distance and <laughs> just wait for a moment well, that's a good segue to another question I have. I mean, can you describe or are you able to describe what it's like to be racing, you know, completely full on for such a long period of time, but still have the mental clarity to ride the technical sections and make those split second decisions about the course? I mean, I think it's hard to understand for viewers, particularly those who've never done cyclocross, you know, just how hard it is, how hard the efforts are, and also how hard the technical bits are. Yeah, I think having good fitness is really essential for those. Not only be able to put out that power through like a big uphill section, but being able to get to the top, take a few breaths, and then point your bike downhill so that you can then ride through a, a rutted descent or make the next move. It's definitely fitness of uh, fitness for not only like being able to put out the power, but able to focus and relax and recover. I think the the most essential component is recovery. Yeah, do you do a lot of training for recovery, like short recovery times of intervals and stuff like that? Yeah, I often, if I'm out doing cyclocross intervals, what I like to do is say there's a big power climb or doing some anaerobic effort, but then transition it where I get to the top of the effort and I turn around and I ride the trail back down as quickly as possible practicing quick turnovers like that is really important then be able to apply them to racing while you're breathing a million miles an hour yeah <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned riding ruts and you know intellectually i completely understand it but it just seems impossible honestly so <laughs> can you sort of talk about how you learn how to do that and what is actually happening when you're riding those ruts yeah there's often a, a point where you're like, should I be riding a rut in a race or should I be crossing over it? Sometimes it's the only way that really make it around a corner because that rut is the most stable. You put your wheels in it and it just kind of rolls you right through. And outside of the rut, it's just too slippery and you can't have any traction to make it around the corner. So mostly it, it's going into it and easing off the brakes and just really weighting yourself, keeping that center of gravity low and pushing through the corner. Overall, it just takes a lot of practice. It's not something that you can just say, okay, I'm going to ride the rut today. <laughs> you got to <laughs> do it again and again and again. Right. 
you talked about deciding which ruts to ride and which ruts not to ride. You know, what are the kind of decisions that you're making for technical decisions that maybe is not always clear during the TV coverage? Mm, definitely. There's so much that you really can't spot. Even throughout the race, the, the course is constantly changing. So one lap you might ride something and it feels like the fastest way around. And then say somebody crashed in it and kind of jostled up the, the dirt there. So now there's like a big kind of a hole or something. Then you have to adapt and change your change your line. So it, it's really, there's so many components to it. I say the, the biggest factor is just kind of being on your toes and constantly scanning what the course looks like around you, what the person in front of you is riding, spotting the points of green grass or traction that might be faster. It's really quite visual on the ground, just constantly scanning. You got uh, second in Namur, one of the World Cup races, and that was probably your first podium, correct, in World Cup? Oh, uh, yes. Can you describe that race and sort of what happened and how you felt? So I went into Namur. That was the race that I had done the previous year, and I had a good result. I finished sixth. And I, I really put a big target on it that season because it was a course that suited me well. There's so much climbing and then the descents are really quite mountain bikey <laughs> almost, uh, which I, I tend to be good at those sharp, like shooting descents. And so, yeah, I went into it just really with a relaxed mind and focused on getting a good result. And then it was, it's almost like, I know they talk about finding that state of flow. And so I felt like early on in the race, even though I was a ways back, I was able to settle right into that. And it was almost like when you're talking about riding a rut, you're able to just kind of let your bike fall into it and push your way through it. And that's how the race felt in total. Going down the descents, just focusing on where the line was to be and seeing myself ride through it before I even hit it. Just really keeping perhaps it's it's kind of like an optimistic view you see yourself hitting it before it you even get there you see yourself exiting the corner and making the next move before it even happens it's really focusing ahead and then when it came up to the the power sections i found that really quickly i was able to put distance on those behind me and catch those in front of me and make some big moves and so just focusing on each little climb and making it like, okay, the goal of this climb is just to make it to the top. And if we can put a pass in there, that's great. Breaking the, the course down into sections like that, just keeping the momentum always moving forward. You've certainly shown that you can move up during a race. How are you managing that? I mean, are you good at sort of divvying out your effort capabilities throughout a period of time and you sort of know that? Yeah, I would I would say my ability to move up in a race highlights some of my strengths as well as some of my weaknesses. I find it really difficult to, in the first five minutes, to go that far into the red that some of these other women are doing, and just going so hard for what feels like an eternity, uh, even though it is only five minutes. And so often... I find myself further back than I would like to be. And that's something I've really worked on this last season. And it used to be that by the end of the first lap, I would be 30th position and then work my way up. And then I was able to improve that so that maybe I'm 10th or so by the end of the first lap. I really like a long race, one that other riders will start the fade in the last 15 minutes so that I can keep powering through and moving up. Often I'll go back and look at lap times and I'll realize that all my laps are about the same by maybe five or 10 seconds. Whereas other riders, their first lap is the fastest and then it starts the tail off from there. So I definitely have a, a very balanced race, whether that's typically the fastest race or not. <laughs> well, it's certainly how time trialists do it. So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you mentioned starts, and that certainly was something that I'd like to talk about. 
Again, I'd like you to describe just how insane they must be, because my guess is the TV coverage just doesn't do it justice. Yeah, it's it is absolutely insane because so at the end of 60 minutes, the number of writers that can maintain such an effort starts to really taper off and narrow down. But when we're talking the first five minutes of a race, so many writers are strong enough to really be holding that effort for so long. And so you're starting off in a field of 80 writers, and then the first five minutes, there's still 80 writers kind of clumped together, trying to make their way around this really narrow, tight course and through all these obstacles. And there's just so much of that racing aggression, throwing elbows and pushing each other and sometimes grabbing bikes. <laughs> it is it is really absolutely chaos. Describe your warm-up. Like, what are you doing before we see you, <laughs> you know, at the starting line? What are every, What is everybody doing to warm up? Yeah, so there's a few phases of the warm-up. I'd say the first phase starts with pre-writing the course. We do that typically two and a half or three hours before the race. And that's really just going over the course one lap, getting an idea of what's ahead, and then maybe doing another lap where you focus on the technical sections and try riding them at speed. And so that's that's kind of like the mental and getting your, your body a little bit physically warmed up. And then about an hour before the race, I jump on the, we have a, a little trainer, a feedback rollers trainer, and that's really the physical warm up where I do 15 minutes or so, just endurance, open up a little, and then you start doing these little building openers where you finish at kind of anaerobic for a minute or so. And then after that, I like to do a couple of sprints so that when I get to the start line, I know I'm ready to, to put out the necessary power, the, the keep up at the start. And then just trying to, after that, keep as warm until you can get actually to that start line. Sometimes that's the most difficult part of a warm up is actually getting off the bicycle and then getting all your clothes on and getting to the start line where it's pouring rain and 35 degrees. It's really difficult to keep warm up to the start. Yeah, it looks like there's actually quite a bit of time between, you know, the time you get off your warm up yeah, you, to the actual start. I, I typically give myself 25 minutes so that the mechanics can swap out the wheels. I have time to take like a, a gel or a drink and get my kit on and then you still have to go to the start and be called up. Right. So what are you going to work on between now and the next season for your starts? I'm going to do a lot of fitness work around that being in that red and being comfortable in that red zone for those first five minutes. I almost have like this instinctive kind of when it's that early on in a 60 minute race, it almost feels like this instinctive, like you, you can't, you shouldn't be going this hard because you won't have enough energy later on in the race. And so I think in a practice, just mitigating that thought and focusing on just really digging deep. <laughs> and what about the sort of the aggression aspect of it? I would think that that would be a huge part of the starts and also one of the areas that would be difficult to train for. Yeah, so my goal for this season is that I I signed a contract with Tipco Silicon Valley Bank and to do some road racing because I see that being in a tight pack, going high speeds around a, a road course and jostling position in those situations will really help the starts, being comfortable, just taking those risks that you really don't take in training. And do you think that the tactics will change once you're getting to that first corner with the leaders? Yeah, I hope so. I hope that instead of it being a race where I'm slowly bridging my way up, it can be on it from the start and really throwing attacks in the first lap with these riders. It will be interesting. You'll have to throw your elbows in different ways. Yeah, yeah. I'm really motivated to do some work to get there. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about the TV coverage. What's it like being on TV? Do you think about that at all? I mean, do you watch it afterwards? Like, how does that 
enter your your thought process? Uh, I guess I don't I don't really think about it too much, honestly, because you never know really where the TV is going to be focusing on a race. I guess my main focus is really kind of on, on my position in the race and who's in front of me and where they are behind me. It was really strange this year. Typically, there's so many fans around courses, and that's really one of the kind of the factors that dips into your peripheries and can be distracting. But this year, it was, it was just so quiet. There's only a few support people on the sides of the courses instead of those fans. Do you like having the fans? I like them during the race. It's exciting and it really builds a fun atmosphere. Some points at which it gets a little bit stressful are when you're trying to warm up and they're coming over and asking for a rider card or when you're trying to roll to the start and there's just so many people and you have to dodge through them all and try and find your way across the course just to get to the starting line can be such an effort sometimes. Have you found that you're good at managing that kind of tension and the tension of the race and sort of sitting at the starting line waiting for it to go and that that kind of sort of extra stress? I think so. Honestly, I think to be able to do well at these races, all of the athletes are managing that stress well. As I mentioned in the intro, if you join our Patreon at any level in the next two weeks, from March 25th through April 4th, I'll be mailing you a small special treat as a thank you in honor of the 100 episodes with such amazing, inspiring women in sport. Even without the bonuses, as a supporter, you can get access to exclusive content, hand-printed, frameable quotes by guests, an opportunity to ask guests follow-up questions, along with our absolute gratitude and some other perks. There are several levels of support to sign up for. At the $5 gear up level and above, you will get access to exclusive monthly audio content. Find us at patreon.com slash hearhersports or link from the Patreon page on our website, hearhersports.com. There you can find details of each level and the different 100th episode gifts. Well, now let's get back to it. You obviously did a really good job at training during the COVID times. How did you manage that? So it was pretty much a year-long effort, I would say. When it became clear, I originally went into the summer looking to do um, a road program with some stage racing. And when it became clear that racing was not going to happen, I focused a lot on building other parts of my riding so I spent a lot of time doing threshold work, uh, which I wouldn't do in a typical season where I need to be sharp and fast in the summer for road races. And then I also got a really cool opportunity. I went to Boulder, Colorado over the summer. I'm studying nutrition in university. And so I went to Boulder to do an internship with Scratch Labs. They make sports drink and nutrition bars. and with Alan Lim, who owns the company, he took us out onto, we had this little ride pod with Ellen Noble and my boyfriend and a few other riders. And we were able to do some really massive supported rides that I'd never had the opportunity to do before. And we were doing these all at altitude. And so we would go ride for four, five, six hours some days and never have to worry about running out of water, always being able to pause and really get in those big endurance miles that I had not had the opportunity to do so before. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Alan Lim ran a team that I raced on for a couple of years. Oh, was that the Celestial Seasoning? Yes. Yes, it was. So cool. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, he was terrific. Uh, he had one of the, the old bicycles still in the scratch warehouse. The, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> the first power tap hub on it. Yeah, yeah. That was exciting to be using power. Do you use power? Is that how you train? I do with training. With racing, there's really no point. <laughs> well, yeah. How are you balancing the school and everything else? So I have a pretty limited school schedule right now because... 
it's just too much to balance 15 credit hours and racing your bike. And I'm also nearing the end of my degree, so I don't have very many credit hours to take. So right now I'm taking two courses. It's actually rather quite convenient that they're both remote. Uh, They wouldn't be if it weren't for COVID, but I guess that's kind of the bright side of all this is I was able to go over to Europe and not miss courses that would have required me to be in person. I was just able to watch lectures online. And what kind of training are you doing now and how are you going to balance, I guess, racing the road season and also preparing for the next cyclocross season? So cyclocross still stands as a top priority for me. I really see road racing as an opportunity to try new experiences, but also build into that cyclocross season. So with racing in the United States, it's all been pushed back to late summer. These stage races I was looking at doing, such as Joe Martin and Redlands Cycling Classic, And they'll actually act as really good fitness building opportunities. I found that in the past when I do a big stage race a couple weeks before cyclocross season, it just, it just kind of like pumps up your fitness and I go into it flying, which is particularly important because they have these big world cups in the United States in the early fall. What's the scuttlebutt in the road season? you know, like how it's going to work with COVID still sort of hanging around. Yeah. In Europe, they found a way to do it. And that's regular testing and it also being condensed. Riders aren't having to get on planes every weekend, but have to do lots of travel. In the United States, we're such a vast country that we really can't do it until I I don't think racing will be able to happen until we have herd immunity here. Mm. So what's your first race? Well, I have a local one coming up this weekend. It's a gravel race down in Northern California called the Shasta Gravel Hugger. Cool, cool. (laughs) Otherwise, I have a few local mountain bike and gravel races that are scheduled to happen because those can be done as time trials or Uh, socially distanced and nobody has to get on a plane to travel to them. But honestly, with the road race calendar, unless I'm sent over to Europe in early summer, then it won't be until July or so that we'll be doing those stage races. Mm. And do you expect to go to Europe? I mean, I, I hadn't realized that TIBCO raced as much as it does in Europe. I'm not a priority right now. And I'm also... This is one of those considerations that North Americans always have to worry about is their visas in Europe. And I was just on a regular visa and the three months I spent for cyclocross used up my 90 days until early May. So I'm not allowed back into Europe until early May. Oh, interesting. And then if you got it, then you would be shut out for another period of time too, right? Yeah. And so it's always, unless you get like a professional racing visa, to be in Europe, you always have to be counting your days and making sure you're not overstaying anything. So what are your plans for next cyclocross season? I know this season was a little bit different because of COVID and there wasn't the racing in the States like there usually is. Yeah, so it really depends on what the the situation is next season. There's still quite a bit of scheduled European racing that we plan to do. And it depends on whether there will be these North American World Cups. But uh, if everything goes as to how it's scheduled right now, we'll race in North America for a few weeks, and then we'll go over and spend some time in Europe racing. And then we'll likely come back for the U.S. Nationals in December and then do a quick turnaround to go back to Europe to do the cursed period. And then we'll come home and hopefully Worlds will be back in the United States and we'll get to finish it with a a really thrilling North American grand finale. That would be cool. I hope to be there if it's going on. Yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic with how things are going right now. You know, you did really well this year. 
And I don't mean this in any way to dismiss how well the American women have done over the past several years, but we're certainly not at the level in the big picture that the Europeans are. What does the U.S. need to do for more women riders to be on the cyclocross podiums in Europe? I think it really takes building that younger generation from an early age. That is what the the Dutch are doing. That's why these junior riders are up there in the top tens at World Cups is because they're really providing them with the resources and the assets so that they can focus on racing their bikes. So in the United States, I think that means having opportunities for younger riders to go to development camps to get better at riding in the United States so that then when it comes around to doing European cross camps, they feel confident and are able to show up and be competitive. So it really takes building athletes from the ground up, I would say. And the Mud Fund, which is the organization that sponsors a lot of junior and developing riders, has really taken initiative in the past few years and hopefully we'll see the results of their hard work paying off with some talented young riders soon. What about the aggressive bit and maybe address it from your point of view? Like what do you wish that you had prior to to your racing in Europe? Like what do you wish you had learned before going there or or what do you think you could have learned maybe? Yeah, I I think more experience road racing would have been helpful. Mm. Uh, Just to get that being comfortable at the high speeds, pushing around for a wheel. I think it also takes increasing the field size and the level of aggression in North American races. And I think uh, USA Cycling is going to address that by, in past years, there's often been two separate races on a single weekend. So say if there's 40 different women in the United States racing that weekend, 20 of them will go to a race on the West Coast and 20 of them will go to race on the East Coast. And so you'd end up with a divided field size. But this coming year, they've gotten rid of those overlapping weekends. So hopefully there'll be all 40 women at one race and all 40 women at another race, which will definitely naturally create a faster and more aggressive race. Is the speed the biggest difference or or is it the aggression? Like what was the biggest surprise for you the first year that you raced in Europe? I would say with that aggressive riding comes high speeds. Sure. sure. Yeah, and so really having more riders, more riding more aggressively, you're just naturally going to have higher faster races. With this time in Europe, you were there with teammates and who else our two mechanics were there with us as well and they were doing much more than a typical mechanic they were driving us to the races and also gary was our our cook (laughs) he made us (laughs) most uh, meals almost every night wow that's nice yeah it was really extraordinary and he's your mechanic you said Mm -hmm. Gary, Gary Wolf and Michael Berry were our mechanics over there this year. Are you deciding your, what tires you want to ride and what inflation and stuff like that? Or, you know, like what role are you taking in, in that? Yeah, ultimately it's down to us riders, the equipment we want to ride, but we definitely use Mike and Gary as a resource, asking them what their thoughts are and discussing the course and the options, like if we want to start on a certain tire and see how that feels at the first lap at a high speed and asking them to also bring a different tire. So if we want to change later in the race, additionally, during the race, you don't really hear it, but sometimes when you pass the pit and you want to lower tire pressure, higher tire pressure, you're going to call out to them and they're going to be there in the pit with the pump and make that adjustment to your bike so that you're ready to go around and get a lower tire pressure bike the next lap. Yeah, talk about how that works. I mean, it, it, as you said, it's hard to see. So on one lap, you'll yell to them or do you yell on one side of the pit and, and the other side of the pit? Like how, like maybe describe a situation where you wanted to change and, and how that went down. Yeah, so 
let's see, for the world's course, I actually started on a, a lower profile tread. And because I thought the, the way the course pre-rode, it was much more stable. It got quite a bit muddier after the men's U23 race. And so we went into that first corner and I think, what was it, Sonny Khan and Celine both slid out and mm -hmm. I definitely felt myself sliding all around. And that first half lap, I called out to Mike and Gary and I was like, the mud tire. And so they were able to set my other, they, they had two bikes in the pit that day. One had another set of dry tires and then they had two sets of mud tires as backups. So they made sure that after that second half lap, I was able to come in and grab a bike with mud tires and be able to ride those tires for the rest of the race. Wow, those mechanics must be able to work really fast. Absolutely, because not only are they like occasionally having to adjust tire pressure to swap wheels, they're also having to run to the, the pressure washers and stand in line. And all this time, they're trying to keep their eyes up and figure out where their rider's on course. Was there other equipment surprises or revelations that you had? Uh, you know, equipment-wise, we were just so well taken care of. Everything was completely covered. I transitioned to riding Cannondales for the first time this year, and I was just so impressed by what a comfortable bike that was. And then with wheels, we have such an abundance of wheels over there. I don't know if people realize this, but with cyclocross, uh, you just have to have vast quantities of tubulars. I think in total we had 30 to 40 pairs of wheels, so 80 wheels wow. in Europe with us, just having that extended range of tire options. So it really, the greatest thing is just having all the equipment is really essential. I can't imagine doing a European season solo. I can't either, honestly. <laughs> You know, that reminded me on the world championships, or was it the world championship? It was one of the final races. It wasn't the world. Maybe you weren't there. And Lucinda Brand had some pedal issues. Mm -hmm. Talk about how you're keeping your pedals clean and how you're keeping your cleats clean. And is that even an issue? It definitely is with some conditions. Occasionally, you'll see riders come out of sections trying to get clipped in and they're banging their pedals with their shoes, trying to right. get that extra... Uh, mud or sand out of there also just being cognizant with your foot placement like if you're running up some steps or a run up looking at where you can take some steps on say asphalt and take like just a natural opportunity that that kicks some mud out of your cleats it's honestly really difficult and I think in that race with Lucinda it was the uh, the freezing conditions and right. probably her her shoes or I don't know if she was riding a special pair of pedals that was causing that issue. Yeah. You mentioned running. What kind of running training are you doing? In the off season, I'll do a mile or two, three, two or three times a week. It's just kind of a nice way to do some cross training and uh, get comfortable running. But honestly, in season, I do most of my running is within bike practice. So going to that wooded area and finding a good long run up and practicing doing laps around that. Sometimes I'll still get out and practice running just with shoes and no bike, but it's mostly combined into riding. And what other training will you be doing in the off season? I mean, do you do strength training or yoga or anything like that? I do do pretty regular lifting weights. And previous years I've gone to a gym <laughs> and I really enjoyed that but currently my gym is my garage and some 20 pound weights and a couple of gallon water jugs filled with water so just nothing no intense like squats or anything just keeping muscles moving in directions beyond the way you use them on the bike every day trying to prevent injury and just grow more stable body structure. What do you expect from the road season? I mean, do you think you're going to really like it? 
Can you imagine switching over? I mean, what are your expectations? It's hard to say since it's just difficult to anticipate what the season will look like. I think I really will enjoy it because I like doing longer races. And it's funny, cyclocross races are in kind of perspective very short. And so I'm excited to go do the stage races and long three-hour races. I think I will really enjoy it. But ultimately, my greatest focus is on next cross season and building into that. What are your goals for next cross season? Or even, you know, like further down the line, what are five years from now? Yeah, in my past year, it's always been keeping that upward trajectory of growth. Getting better at racing in the United States, getting some U.S. podiums and going over to Europe and feeling like I'm starting to understand the game. And so to go back over to Europe next year to potentially win a race, to get some more World Cup podiums would be exceptional. And that's what I'm going to be working for this off season or non-cyclocross season. In preparing to talk to you, I listened to some of the podcasts that you've been on and I've read some interviews with you. And I think one thing that really strikes me is your attitude about training and improving. And Mm -hmm. I think that's such an interesting, I mean, because when I talk to guests, there are those who really like the competition and there are those who really like the training and the improving aspect. And you definitely seem to be in sort of that second category. Do you think about that a lot or at all? Yeah, I think naturally I do really enjoy training. And I also really enjoy racing and But I feel that I've gotten really good at training the past two years. I found environments in which I'm able to go find roads that really suit the program for that day, the the intervals I might need to do, or the type of ride I want to do. And I just find it so satisfying to be able to go out and really nail a hard training session and come back home. Racing is kind of like an every weekend treat you get to do and training. If you look at it that way, it's almost every day you get the reward of doing a solid workout. Sort of following along those lines, I mean, are there, I guess I'm not exactly sure to ask that, but are there sort of qualities that you're looking to improve in yourself over this off season? And, you know, like, physical abilities or mental capabilities or anything that will carry over into your racing? I think building myself as a snappier athlete, and that is both physical, trying to increase that proportion of fast twitch muscles is something I'm going to be focusing on this year, but also kind of the mental component, the response time and trying to get that as low as possible. So I think both the mental and the physical are, it's nice because those are things that you can kind of combine into single workouts as well as divide up. Um, So I'm really looking forward at just kind of increasing that snap this off season. You mentioned that you are in school for nutrition. How are you taking advantage of that? I would think that that's a really good bonus to have. Yeah, it's led to some cool opportunities such as going to Boulder this past summer and getting the work with Alan Lim. It's fun to apply to my day-to-day training, thinking about how the best fuel for a ride and uh, experiment with different theories on nutrition. And I guess ultimately it's, it's building connections within the race or the, the cycling scene and hopefully getting to extend that to a, another career someday will be really exciting. What kind of fueling are you doing on the bike while racing or training? Especially, I mean, it will be very different when you start doing the road racing. Yeah, it it depends quite a bit on the temperature and how much you're sweating. So I really learned to emphasize the importance of taking in a lot of salt when you're out training in the heat and then just consuming enough calories in general for these long, hard days, it was really eye-opening to spend the summer riding without, like, you know, when you go for a big, long endurance ride and you're kind of monitoring how much water you have or how many snacks you have out in that ride. And you're like, well, I've got another three hours, so I better kind of slow down how much I'm drinking. But being able to spend the summer just taking a bottle after bottle and never being concerned about running out of water 
really showed me how important that component of nutrition is to writing and being able to maintain it over a long time. Were you drinking water or some sort of uh, mix? Uh, so mostly uh, drink mixes with a lot of salt, moderate amount of carbohydrate, but yeah, just a lot of salt to replace what you lose when you sweat. Hmm. And so calories were, were less of an issue. Yeah, I, I tend to prefer to eat those just because it's a slower digestion instead of going straight to your stomach and causing GI distress. Mm -hmm. What are you eating? We made a lot of rice cakes. I got very talented at making bacon and egg rice cakes. And oh, my God. <laughs> experimented with some other flavors. <laughs> That's funny. I want the recipe. <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's just the, the Scratch Labs standard recipe. Sounds good. Is there anything that I missed? I think that's most of my life, riding bikes. <laughs> and Yeah, that's about all. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Clara. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thank you. I've really enjoyed it. Well, that wraps it up for the first 100 conversations on Hear Her Sports. Thank you so much for following along, reading our newsletter, and supporting women's sports. Continue doing your good work, spreading the word about the podcast and these wonderful female athletes as we continue creating more episodes for you to enjoy, learn from, and be inspired by. Also, thank you to Clara for being here today. Find links to her team and the other things we talked about in the show notes. Subscribe for free to hear her sports on Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Remember to join Patreon at patreon.com slash hearhersports and get your special gift for the 100 episodes. And buy all your books through our bookshop page at hearhersports.com slash books. While 44% of athletes are women, only 4% of the media coverage is about women. Hear Her Sports aims to shift the scale while inspiring women to be their best. Until next time, this is Elizabeth Emery for Hear Her Sports. Bye-bye. I honestly don't read very much sports related literature just because I feel like I spend so much time with my mind on sports. At the end of the day, it's like, oh, let's look at something else.